ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय The perfection of religion. What is the perfection of religion? Herein, <clears throat> I'm not going to discuss or get into detail about the claims of atheism. I'm going to start off from the level of acceptance by the hearers that religion is worth pursuing. Um, of course, at the present time especially, thanks to the, or not thanks to the <laughs> efforts of persons like Dr. Richard Hawkins, Sam Harris, and the late Christopher Hitchens. And in Hindu culture, when we say late means expired, we say something like swaga prapta, means gone to heaven. But we don't know in the case of Christopher Hitchens. He's dead, but I don't think even if there was a heaven, if he'd want to go. Anyway, that's another subject. We start from the level of acceptance that religion is important, essential, uh, atheism is predicated on and in many ways non-different from philosophical materialism. It's getting a bit tough for the translator. <laughs> Tatvik Bhotiktavad, uh, in which they presume that there is nothing but matter. We cannot perceive with our senses, we cannot see, touch, taste, smell, feel, or hear, according to them, anything but matter. So therefore, we conclude that there is nothing but matter. But intrinsically, I, I don't know about you, but I can, and I'm sure many others can also, can intuitively understand that I am not chemicals. I am not matter. I am more than chemicals. And in fact, there is a, uh, a major discussion in the field of consciousness, the, the hard in uh, the problem of consciousness in philosophy at the present time in the Western world, the hard problem of, it's called the hard problem of consciousness. Who is it? What, what is, what is the entity that perceives? We can biologically, uh, explain that someone who feels pain, uh, they, their C fibers are firing and it produces a it's this firing of the C fibers is conveyed to a certain part of the brain, but the actual experience cannot be experienced by chemicals, according to some. Others say that, well, it's just a matter of time before we understand, just like we used to think that light was something separate, some separate kind of being, practically spiritual, because we couldn't explain it. Or we used to think that objects which caught fire means that within those objects there was a substance called phlogiston. But now it's discovered that there's no such thing. So in course of time, we will discover, according to the materialists, that uh, there is no such thing as soul or consciousness independent of matter. But... Uh, Logically, it doesn't follow that 
because previously people didn't understand what light is, but then they discovered that it is something material and they didn't understand how fire came about, uh, that it doesn't follow logically that in future we shall discover that consciousness is a symptom of matter. Although some people say they've already discovered it. But, um, anyway, as I, I said, I wouldn't get into that. I'm getting into it. Um, you can say that people who do not believe in the soul and in God, they're unfortunate. They're cut off from a major part of reality or the major part of reality, uh, which actually even children or so-called primitive peoples can intuitively understand that beyond their present level of existence, there is some dimension which we may call the spiritual. And people think we'll become more advanced and more sophisticated. Uh, but actually, they're, they're, people are becoming more separated from their real nature. Mm. Just like in, in the modern industrial society, people become separated from their real nature. Uh, so, uh, it's something to be, at, at the most basic level, to be intuitively understand that we, so that we are all spiritual. Every living being is spiritual by nature. We're not just chemicals. And to go further, that there is a, there is a controller. There is a supreme controller. Things are not going on by chance. So um, we accept this. As we'll start off our discussion with this point, and just uh, without getting it into much detail, we can say that just as blind men cannot conceive of the uh, what it means to see, what is sunlight, what is visible form, what are colors, so atheists cannot believe in the existence of God. They become very sophisticated. It means they they accept some duplicitous logic by which they presume themselves to be more intelligent and more capable of knowing than they actually are. And they also, there's also in materialistic science this uh, accepted axiom which has no, actually no logical basis that Knowledge is only that which we can prove according to our systems. That we, we've, we've made some methodology and we say that if you can't prove something according to our methodology, then we simply uh, say that to even to think of it or even to study it is foolish. But uh, we who are here, as humans on this planet, we say, look up, look up higher, beyond matter. Uh, there is a higher purpose of life. There is meaning to life. It's not just that we're a bunch of chemicals that got put together, or not put together, just formed into various bodies, and they enter the, this particular form of chemicals interacts with other forms of chemicals. No, there is a higher purpose of life. There is the spiritual aspect of life. Uh, that is what uh, this, this discussion is all about. Uh, so this discussion is for people who want to be religious in the best possible way. Now, um, we may think that, well, or many people think, well, well, my religion is the best. The best possible way you can be religious is to follow my religion. And why is it the best? Well, I'm following it, so it must be the best. 
It's not a very good logic. Or people tend to get in very constricted uh, ways of thinking. Uh, but actually our search should be for the truth. What is the ultimate truth? We may think that, well, how are there gradations of religion? You're either in the right religion or you're in the wrong religion. Many people think like that. Uh, but there may be gradations also. We see gradations uh, everywhere. The children going to school. They, there's someone at the top of the class and someone at the bottom of the class. There's uh, in the running race, there's, someone is faster and someone is slow. Of course, religion isn't or shouldn't be a matter of competition, but still we can say some things are better than others. Some food is more healthy in general for people to eat than other food. Some climates are generally more salubrious, which means uh, conducive to good health, than others. Uh, and even within the practice of a certain religious system, there may be better ways to follow and less good ways to follow. So there is a gradation, and this discussion is for persons who want to be religious in the best possible way. That, that means that they look around and see that, all right, there are so many different religious paths being professed in the world, and what's the best, at least for me? How can I best practice? If we consider that religion is meant to be concerned with our eternal life as compared to the uh, blip of time that we're on this planet in a human body, uh, and that religion is a preparation in this life for the eternal, then we should be very serious about it and we should be serious to find out what is the best way that we can practice. Uh, we should also see that although uh, in the past maybe religions have tended to be very uh, closed, limited in their outlook, our, our way is the best, our way is the only way. That doesn't really work in the modern world when you, when you have thousands of people always saying that our way is the only way and the best way, then um, you could do a roulette or lottery kind of way to try to find out the best religion. But otherwise, we should take an intelligent and non-sectarian approach. Now, uh, obviously, I have made a choice, and I, which means I think I know which is the best path. I'm, I'm not sitting here as a neutral philosopher, but I've chosen a path. And ultimately, if we are to uh, best develop ourselves in terms of religion, then we have to follow some path. It's not enough just to say that, well, all paths are good and not really follow any of them fully or properly or just choose a bit here, choose a bit there. Um, we, have the, we have to follow a path. And choosing a bit here and choosing a bit there, uh, that also won't work very well because uh, different paths, they, they, they're... they're they're integral parts. That means you just can't take a, a bit. All the bits fit together. So you have to follow one path. And I've chosen a particular path. But I want to present um, not with the attitude of bashing my religion is better than your religion or my God is better than your God. My God's going to... If you don't shut up, I'll send my God to beat up your God or, or some foolish ideas like this. Um, but in an intelligent and uh, non-sectarian way, uh, um, in, which we, in which we invite persons who are interested to hear, to consider what's being spoken, and try to understand for themselves. Now, of course, many people say religion is a matter of faith, and of course, matter, faith must be there. If we are to believe in or, or accept something which is beyond our immediate level of sensory perception, then some level of faith may be there. 
But at the same time, we find that in every religious system, or at least those which we may call bona fide religions, the scriptures are given, and scriptures we can understand are God's communication to man. That means God wants us to understand about him. In other words, he's speaking to our intelligence. So we can immediately uh, make one inference that uh, one symptom of the best religion is that which makes the most sense on the platform of intelligence. I'll get back to that later because it is a big subject and uh, it's a nuanced subject considering that uh, our own intelligence is very limited and we may tend to uh, mislead ourselves, self-cheating. Anyway, uh, trying to keep it somewhat simple because we could get into many uh, complex discussions of details, but I'm just trying to outline some of the most simple points in this very important dis uh, um, discussion. Yeah, I just I want to present it in a fairly uh, simple and systematic and non-dogmatic way. There's no use just to say, well, our way is the best, and if you don't follow, you'll go to hell. And That way of speaking does convince many people. If, if someone speaks in a very convincing style, they may be able to convince many people, but it might not be correct. Just, to, just if someone sounds convincing, be careful, don't be convinced. After all, uh, the, even in the non-religious field, uh, persons like Adolf Hitler spoke in a very uh, convincing way, and they convinced others to follow him. Nikolai Lenin, or Vladimir Lenin, whatever you want to call him. Um, he spoke in a very convincing way and got others to follow him. But in retrospect, we can understand that however convincing they were, their message was absolutely demoniac. <clears throat> And the result of their, uh, of the, the teachings and the path they led people on was absolutely disastrous and horrible and resulted in the unnecessary murder of m literally millions of people. So just because someone sounds convinced should not be grounds for an intelligent person to accept that they might be right, because the, it, it's very possible to be fully convinced of something that is absolutely wrong, and even to proselytize, to try to bring people uh, to one's own way of understanding or thinking. <clears throat> now, most people who are religious, and still uh, most people in the world do consider themselves to be religious at some level or other. Uh, in some countries, more so than others. For instance, I don't think you'll find, at least in my experience, in Bangladesh, uh, during the, I was there during the 1980s, I don't think I ever met anyone who didn't uh, intrinsically accept that there is God and there is religion and religion is important. Certainly no one was propagating it. Um, it's probably the same nowadays also. Uh, probably in Saudi Arabia you won't find any atheists, maybe some closet atheists. It might be dangerous to be an atheist though. You might lose your head, uh, literally. Um, but generally all of the uh, it may be said uh, this is part of atheistic propaganda that the, where people are the more people are educated uh, the more likely they're to be atheists they have figures like that that among scientists the rate of people who have university degrees in science the in the western countries the percentage of atheists is greater and the higher you go in science, the higher the percentage of atheists is. Well, that doesn't necessarily prove that 
the more intelligent people are, the more likely they are to be atheists. It could also uh, be a product of the education itself being intrinsically atheistic in outlook. But anyway, most of the people in the world are atheistic. Uh, sorry, theistic. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, they mostly fall into broad categories as Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, these are the major groups, and then there's a large number of uh, Jews, although they're not in the very big numbers, but they're still, uh, and they are, their influence in the world is uh, disproportional to their numbers. And uh, there are also uh, various, what we call, may call in terms of the number of adherents, minor religions, such as uh, Shintoism, Zoroastrianism, better known as the Parsis who follow it, Sikhism, Jainism, and so on. But most people who are religious, they they adhere to a certain religion, mostly because they're born into that culture. The vast majority of Hindus are Hindus because they were born in a Hindu family. And we can repeat that statement with a slight change. The vast majority of Muslims are Muslims because they were born into what we would call a Muslim family, although Richard Dawkins doesn't like such statements, but we don't have to go along with what he says. Most people, are, most people who identify themselves are Christians because they were born in a Christian family. And it would seem that in the vast majority of cases, they never really thought about why I'm a Christian, Hindu, Muslim, or whatever. Just they're born in that, that environment. That identity is what they grow up with. You grow up with your, uh, with certain identity. I am a boy, or I am a girl. Uh, I am Thai, from Thailand. I am a Buddhist. It all goes together as part of the package, the identity that we've given and the culture that we're raised in and we go along with it. Some people become religious later in life. They may be actually raised in an atheistic background or in a background which is not very religious. In other words, they may be nominally only Jews, Christians or whatever, uh, or they may uh, be raised in a, in a culture or in a family which is not very religious at all, and then later they become religious. But even in the case of such people, they, if they tend to become religious in terms of the predominating culture in which they find themselves. Uh, that's less and less so in countries like England and America, where there is a strong influence of multiculturalism and uh, Christianity, which has been dominant in those countries for uh, more than one and a half millennia, is at its lowest ebb and getting lower all the time. So uh, people, if they want to become religious, don't naturally gravitate toward Christianity. There are other people who, although raised in a uh, religious environment later in life, they think, oh, I, I don't like this. I don't want to be part of this. I don't want to go on like this with my whole life. And uh, interestingly, uh, in America, where there are still theological colleges where people go to specifically to study the Bible, uh, many people, or, or they take up Bible studies in a, in a university which is not wholly and solely theological, uh, it's quite often the case that when after studying the Bible they become atheists, when they study in more detail and find out all the contradictions and all the, uh, all the things which... Uh, they believed in are put up to question and there are no good answers. For instance, that the 
the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, it's according to tradition, they're all written by Moses. But scholarly analysis strongly suggests that there were four or five different authors, which may not seem to be a very big thing, but it's the kind of thing, where if you put enough things like that together, then people tend to lose their faith. So, um, our, our real approach, instead of becoming uh, skeptical, should be how to find the truth. When we say, what is the, what is the perfection of religion? We're not talking about whether it's better to, just like uh, the Muslims, they're supposed to, and many do actually, pray five times a day, bowing down toward Makkah. Um, the Hindus are supposed to do some puja every day in the morning, although that's almost forgotten. Practically, there's nothing in Hinduism that, that is prescribed. That, that There's no practice that can identify you as a Hindu. For the Christians, there's going to church on Sundays. They should minimally do that. For the Hindus, there isn't anything in particular that defines them. For the Jews, I guess, they're supposed to go to the synagogue on Saturdays. Um, for Christians, yeah, the, the, the defining point of a Christian, although there are some Christians who don't believe in this, but they're considered heterodox, you're supposed to believe that uh, Jesus is God who came as man and uh, died on the cross to absolve us from all our sins. And you have to, be if you believe that, then you're a Christian. If you don't believe it, you're not a Christian. Although Jesus, from the records we have in the Bible, never said or even hinted such a thing. Anyway, um, we should seek for the truth. What is the actual truth? Um, what is the ultimate reality? So the perfection of religion is to, first of all, understand what is the highest manifestation of religion and the best way that we can practice it so that we may become to the level that we can as very tiny beings perfected in religion. Considering that religion is so important, it's concerned with our eternal identity. Uh, I, I, um, so, what is religion? What do we define as religion? Um, it can be difficult to define. It depends how we define it. If we define it in cultural terms, then we could include Buddhism. Although Buddhists themselves, uh, those who are more philosophical about being Buddhists, they claim that Buddhism isn't a religion. And actually, it isn't, in as much as uh, there's no acceptance of God, no supreme God. In some branches of Buddhism, which arose after the Buddha, who didn't speak about any such things, there is acceptance of gods or treating Buddha himself as a god. But... Uh, Buddhism, as we understand from what Buddha taught and is most closely followed by what is nowadays called as Theravad Buddhism to distinguish it from Mahayana and Yogacara and Vajrayana and so many other schools of Buddhism is uh, intrinsically atheistic, not in the sense that it denies the existence of God, but there's no discussion of the topic whatsoever. And an important term in Buddhism is anatma, which means there is no soul. So, uh, on the other hand, they do accept reincarnation, and it's difficult to understand how they can do so when there's no uh, soul involved. And it has many of the trappings of religion. We'll find even Theravad, traditional Theravad Buddhists, for instance, in Sri Lanka, they, 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 for instance, they worship the tooth 
of Buddha, which I, I, I'm not sure Buddha would actually approve of that. <laughs> um, um, so there, there are the trappings of, of, of the outward form of religion. They have monks, they have, religi- they have rituals, ringing bells, and we'll find in um, many religious systems, ringing of bells is important. Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, maybe in uh, Judaism, I don't know. I think in Islam, not so. In Chinese religions, um, Shintoism, all this kind of thing, ringing bells. So Buddhism has many of the outer trappings, but uh, Buddhists are of religion, but Buddhists are actually uh, more philosophical, will say that it's, it's actually a moral, moral and ethical system and a philosophy, but not a religion in the true sense of the term. Um, Buddhism arose, of course, within India, and it adopted many of the uh, practices and many of the ideas that Buddha taught. They weren't original ideas in the sense that they're already there within what we nowadays call Hinduism, although at that time there was no such term as Hinduism. For instance, that this world is full of suffering, the sufferings of birth, death, old age, and disease. They're already very, uh, they're already central to the uh, Hindu understanding, the understanding of uh, reincarnation. Um, but much of Hinduism, although it's called a religion, for the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to say are, are, are not truly religious or they do not and cannot lead to the perfection of religion because they're also inherently atheistic, which many Hindus would deny. But the idea which is uh, the, prominent in Hinduism and which uh, Christian missionaries analyzing it all, they, they uh, came to the conclusion that the, the idea that ultimately everything is all one, which has gone to the West in a very big way in New Ageism, it's actually atheism. It, even though within Hinduism there are worship of many gods, um, but the, the the underlying idea that everything is all one and, and that one a, a person, an individual, can ultimately by meditation and yoga uh, surpass all the gods and become one with the supreme being who's ultimately not a person. This is ultimately atheism. Now it's not that everyone who is called a Hindu subscribes to this idea, although it is almost ubiquitous, all-pervading in Hinduism. There are, however, those... uh, It's not so well known uh, outside of India because this uh, impersonalistic kind of Hinduism was first propagated in the West. And maybe within India it's also not so very well known that there are many persons who nowadays would be called Hindus, but at the time they didn't call themselves Hindus because there there was no such word, who are strongly opposed to this idea and who insist that there is one supreme God. So for the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to say that the perfection of religion lies in accepting that there is one supreme God and our relationship with him, understanding our relationship with that supreme person and knowing how to act in that that relationship and how to become fully absorbed in that relationship, that is uh, the perfection of religion. Because the idea of becoming one with the Supreme, again, this is another very big discussion which has been going on for centuries uh, among uh, philosophers in India, Vedanta philosophers, (coughs) 
the idea that we can become one with the Supreme is absurd. We are not Supreme. And we are not ever going to be Supreme. We are, we are uh, eternal living beings, but we are, that means we're real, but we are dependent upon the Supreme Reality. We cannot become the Supreme Reality. So I'm not going to get into detail into that here because it's too much to get in, too much of a discussion. That requires another uh, long discussion. But for the sake of this discussion, I'm going to say that uh, religion means to accept that there is the Supreme Person known in Christianity as the Supreme Father or the Supreme Being upon whom we are dependent. So the perfection of religion begins with uh, accepting that as a fact. Now, um, there, there is also the very big field of, uh, apart from the philosophical approach which culminates in imagining oneself to be one with the Supreme or even having some uh, experience uh, of, of thinking oneself to be merging with some cosmic white light. Um, similar to this, not exactly in approach, but in um, in the ultimate goal is, is mysticism. Um, yoga practice or uh, coming to a different platform of reality. There, there have been some mystics within the Christian tradition, although within the Christian tradition it's generally not been discouraged and in fact uh, at one point was strongly discouraged by uh, such methods as burning at the stake. That's uh, that has traditionally been a Christian response to uh, unorthodox approaches. Uh, it's quite different to the religious atmosphere of India, which was so open uh, that it became practically to India's disadvantage as a nation. That it, India was so tolerant of religious approaches that uh, they've allowed, and still do, allow others to uh, proselytize in a manner which is uh, to the Hindu culture. It's uh, very detrimental. And I'm using the word Hindu here as a in a conventional term, although there's no such uh, scriptural term within what people would call the Hindu scriptures. There's no such term as Hindu. It's a relatively modern term. So, uh, religion. What is religion? We should accept there is this supreme being within Islam. They won't say the supreme father. Uh, They'll say the supreme being. All right. So this we can accept as religion. There is a supreme being, a supreme person upon whom uh, we are dependent. We have to accept our dependence upon, pray to, uh, expect mercy from, worship. This then we can accept as being uh, religion. Now, different people approach this supreme being who we may uh, use the English term for God, as I'm speaking in English, um, although obviously uh, this term is loaded with uh, cultural and particularly uh, Christian baggage, but anyway, we can say in general, God. People approach God for different reasons. They may approach him because they're feeling distressed. Please protect me from, save me from my distress. Because they want money, please give me money. They may uh, 
approach him uh, uh, just out of some kind of curiosity. What's this all about? They may not be so very serious, or they, but they may be interested on a philosophical level or just curious level out of fear because they're told if you don't believe in God, you'll burn in hell forever. Maybe out of a sense of duty. Yes, well, my mother told me I have to go to church every Sunday. So now my mother's dead, but anyway, she, want, she wanted me to go, so I should go. Or just maybe without thinking, because... If you're in a village where everyone goes to church on Sunday, then you don't really think about why you do. It's just everyone does it. So you should also do it. As I saw in my childhood, as a, being raised as a Roman Catholic. everywhere It's a ritual. Sunday morning, you put on your Sunday best. That means you're, instead of having your regular school clothes or working clothes, you put on your best clothes, which you reserve for going to church or going to marriages or funerals or something like that, put on your Sunday best, go to church and uh, try to stay awake during the service and uh, it lasts for almost an hour. Then you come out and then you meet all your friends and the men go over the road to the pub and the women go home to cook the roast beef if you can afford it, if not roast chicken, the best, the best meal of the week. Uh, so it's like a ritual and those who are at least in my generation, those who are raised as Catholics, they just do it as without even thinking, just as a sense of ritual. Um, it's just what everyone else does. Uh, some people may do from a sense of genuine attraction, that yes, oh, so nice to go to pray to God, how how. They feel some enthusiasm for this. They want to do it. Uh, just having said something negative about one system of religion, which sounds negative about one system of religion, my own experience in that, I can relate one experience, uh, another experience, a more positive experience, um, that uh, once uh, driving in a rural area, in Bangladesh, at evening time, I, I saw one boy alone in a field. I, I don't know what he may have been. Anyway, whatever he was doing there, alone in a field and uh, falling down on the ground, with looking to do so with great alacrity or enthusiasm, falling down on the ground, clearly to offer namas, prayers. Uh, so that's an instance of someone. He didn't have to do it. There was no one there to tell him, now you have to do it, but out of... And, and also regularly uh, traveling on boats in Bangladesh. There'd be uh, ferries, not exactly ferries, uh, but uh, boat service going up. You'd maybe go on a five-hour boat journey and at... Uh, at midday or whatever, the uh, someone there would call the others to prayer, and then uh, most of the men would go with the had this pump well which takes water directly from the river, and people would wash their their forearms and lower legs and go, and then they'd do all their namas together like this. And then for them, it seems just normal thing to. They're happy to do that. They like to do that. And again, again I, I, it can go on like this. <laughs> in Bangladesh, many times, again, traveling on the boats, because that's, that's the time when I would be, have more association with Muslims. Otherwise, I was mostly with Hindus. You'd see people just sitting and with their beads, 27 beads on their string, and saying the names of Allah. They have, they have a boat journey, a long time, so they, they sit and they... And uh, you, you have also seen, it's a very common in among Hindus in India, when they're traveling, you'll see they'll bring out some some worn-out book, Vishnu Sahasranam or something like this, and they'll read from that. Or Sikhs, it's very common. You'll see men and women, they'll bring out some book and they'll read. They like to do it. No one's forcing them to do it. But they feel pleasure, satisfaction, comfort 
or whatever in doing so. So people, for various reasons or a mix of various reasons, they may approach God. Uh, there's a saying, there are no atheists in the trenches. The trenches. <laughs> this is, uh, the word trench particularly applies to World War I in Europe, where there were flat fields in uh, Flanders, part of long, huge areas of flat fields, and there'd be the German soldiers on one side and the English and French and Belgians or whatever on the other side, facing a flat field, facing each other over flat with a trench, which means a ditch, ditch dug in the ground, and there'd be and on one side, in one ditch or trench, there'd be the uh, the Germans, and on the other side, the English, French, Belgians, or whoever else might be there. So, you're in the trench, and on the other side is the enemy. If you put your head up, you're likely to get a bullet in it. It's a, it's a war situation. So, there's a saying that there are no atheists in the trenches. Because and, and, apart from being dangerous, there's another factor of tremendous boredom because you don't put your head up, so you just keep your head down, and they don't put their head up either, so you're just they're just stuck week after week, month after month, they're just stuck with nothing to do. The pointlessness, the misery, the depression, and the fear. Uh, led to the saying that there's no athe there are no atheists in the trenches. Uh, people uh, in in such a situation, there's no there's no recourse but to turn to God, natural instinct, we may say. Of course, the atheists will say there's something wrong with that. Um, but anyway, for different reasons, people take to religion. They believe in God. They pray to God. They, they may be very sick. Um, they're, oh, there's one somewhat well-known incident in America. There was a video made out of it of a, of a man who had been actually very nasty to others throughout his life and very exploitive. And then uh, he's from America. He's on, hol on holiday in Paris. He had a massive heart attack or stroke or whatever, then he had this experience um, of the doctor or nurse calling him, come, come with us. So he went and he walked and he thought he was, had to, he was walking for an operation, but as he was walking down the tunnel, he found that more and people were pushing him and they were calling him bad names. And it, as he walked on, he, he felt he couldn't go back but as he walked on, more and more and more, they became more rough and more violent. And they started screaming at him and, and looking really ferocious. And then he saw the faces of all the people who had mistreated in his life. And they were, they were scratching him and kicking him. And he, he, he thought, now I'm on my way to hell. And at this time, although all his life he'd been, for most of his life he'd been atheistic and had, and had, said bad things about God and religion. Uh, he just remembered from his childhood that his mother had told him to pray to God. So at this time he called out, God! And then all this thing vanished and he found himself on his bed again. So then he recovered from his illness and he became a Christian preacher. So it may be that people, they... They have some remembrance of God, even though all their life they've rejected that. For very, and we were just saying for various reasons people approach God. Uh, why do people become religious at all? Uh, some may do so out of a sense to, to promote their own prestige. That in a society where being religious is considered respectable, then people it's considered proper. It's part of being a respectable member of society to believe in God and to go to church and to give charity to the church. 
And uh, if someone is seen to be very, in, in a religious society, if someone is seen to be religious or very religious, that may increase their prestige. That may be hypocritical. They're not really approaching God. They're really doing so to increase their own prestige. And there are many stories like this. And Jesus told the story of the, the widow who was very poor and she had very little money, but still she gave half of it secretly to God in the temple, whereas some other priests, they made a big show of giving a large amount of money in charity, although it was actually very little compared to their total net worth. And Jesus said that the widow, she got her reward in heaven, but the priests, they got their reward on earth in the, name, in the form of name and fame. So that's not really a... That's, you could say that's being religious, but it's not really religious in the true sense. It's actually being materialistic, which is one reason why, one reason probably why some people who are religious become disenchanted with religion when they see there's a lot of hypocrisy going on in the name of religion. So the perfection of religion is obviously not a hypocritical or self-motivated approach. The perfection of religion is to... Uh, worship God because we like to, uh, because we feel uh, we want to do so, because he wants us to do so. Um, that may begin with a sense of gratitude that, oh, God made so many nice things for us, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the good Lord made them all. So there's, there's a concept that God made this very nice world and we should be grateful to him that he made this nice world that can we that we can live in, as Louis Armstrong sung. What a wonderful world. Of course, this kind of preaching might not be very effective at the present time in, for instance, Syria or Iraq. Uh, but if you're living... For instance, uh, in America, and you're living very peacefully, and you have a secure job uh, firing missiles from there via computer to Syria or Iraq, you might thank God for giving you a wonderful world to live in and giving us uh, wonderful missiles to destroy all those horrible people over there. Um, sorry for the sarcasm. Um, so a sense of gratitude is there, that God made the world nice. Of course, that could, uh, that could change if one is subjected to seeing situations which are not so very nice, as uh, an example I've cited several times. Ram Jet Malani, a well-known lawyer in India, fairly well-known, probably not known outside of India, probably has some offspring living in America. Uh, he said, well, I used to believe in God, but when I went to the scene of the earthquake in Bhuj, in Gujarat state, then I stopped believing in God. When I saw so many children that had been trapped in the rubble under a school and had died or were suffering, then I thought, well, there can't be any God. So the sense of gratitude um, for God having made everything nice for us, um, that can run into problems when things don't always go the way that we hope they will do. Uh, a sense of gratitude is not misplaced uh, in relationship to God, but we will need more than being, gratitude, being grateful for the, uh, the birds and the beasts, all all things, all things bright and beautiful. We'll need to go uh, beyond that. That's a bit shallow. Um, so gratitude leads to duty. Um, let's move on to a, a higher level. We can we can go further than this. Um, all right, I'll stop there now. continue tomorrow. God willing, we can't say for sure if 
we'll see tomorrow through the present eyes that we're seeing. All right.